What's up, guys? How's it going? Um, I'm in a different place. I, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but I'm in a new office, and this is just helping me concentrate a bit better and get out of the house, and it's like this co-working space, so it's pretty affordable, and I can bike to it, which is really cool. So yeah, there's a new place. I think I'm going to make my new games here, actually. So yeah, welcome to my office. Uh, take a seat. Um, this is great. I hopefully you can hear me because I had to set up all this new equipment and everything. But uh, I'm excited you're here, and I, I got my chat window right here, and I'm excited just to talk about Nintendo Switch specifically. I thought this was a good time to talk about it because um, I put the game on sale about a week and a half ago, and it just hit the bestsellers list um, yesterday. And it's not, you know, I don't, I don't want my head to get too big because uh, it's, uh, it's number 30 on the digital, like the download only list, which is the last spot. So <laughs> it's still cool though. And I wanted to answer questions about publishing to console because that's, it's a, the biggest professional hurdle I've ever like accomplished. And also it's the reason I was able to like quit my job is because my game has sold very well on Switch. And I wanted to talk about how you could self publish as an indie developer and maybe talk about any questions you have so yeah, this is, this is the new office. Um, thanks guys for joining. Sound is perfect, cool. I had to like, this is a nice mic. This is an SM7B by Shure, but you have to like really adjust it so that you can hear it properly. But yeah, we got all this, we got all this uh, fun, like nice, uh, nice people here in the chat. We got uh, my new office. Yeah, this is where I'm gonna be. I'm, I'm thinking I invested in this new camera and microphone and stuff. Um, because I really want to stream more. I love streaming. I just, I, I like editing video. I think I'm burnt out on editing so many videos for the online course. But I like streaming because I can talk and answer questions. It's interactive. And I'm hoping to like, when I make, when I start on my new game, I'm hoping to uh, stream more of the process here, if that makes sense. So yeah, um, yeah, I want to I wanna talk to you guys. Thanks for being here. This is exciting. And I didn't like do an email blast or a tweet or anything. I just, I just posted the live schedule like to see if people would show up. So appreciate you guys coming here. We got 64 people, this is great. Um, you people are very nice, thank you. It's very nice to see you guys. Where I live, it's night, it's midnight. Oh yeah, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. I think I'll have, this video will be replayable too. Um, and yeah, I'll answer any questions you guys have, um, but I'll, it'd be fun to focus on console because that is a big thing people, indie developers don't really know where to start with. And like I said, if I didn't go through with the porting process and if I didn't find the right help to help me pass certification, I would not be a full-time indie developer. It's that simple, but it's hard. It's hard porting a game to console. It's really awesome though. So yeah, uh, let's, let's, yeah, what do you, what do you guys, do you want me just to talk about my experiences? Uh, I could talk about the porting experience, the, the challenges I had to overcome. And of course, when you work with a console company, including, you know, all three, they, uh, they have you sign an NDA or a non-disclosure agreement. So I can't talk about anything sensitive that would break my NDA. And that includes sales numbers, I can't talk about the actual publishing process or the details, um, but I can talk about uh, things in general and you know just things that are not covered, not like covered by the NDA, because a lot of stuff is like public knowledge. I just can't talk about the confidential stuff. Um, yeah, I had a comment saying, "How do you make how do you make money? It's only two euros." <laughs> Yeah, it's on sale for 70, wait, 85% off? No, wait, 75% off. So it's $2.50, um, probably the same amount of euros. And it's all by volume. And here's something interesting about Nintendo Switch and the eShop. And this isn't NDA, this is public knowledge. When you are on the best sellers list or on the great deals list, um, the order, you know, it's most popular games, but on Steam, what is like what is a popular game especially like what if the game is free and what if uh like a 60 dollars game is like selling less units but making more money than like a five dollar indie game you know what i mean 
On Steam, it's usually like the top list, the top sellers. I think it's determined by revenue or there's like a certain algorithm. So it's kind of like it, it like it's a weighted it's a weighted balance between the price of a game and how many copies they sell. On Nintendo Switch, here's the thing about the eShop. It is 100% units sold. And they just introduced a new rule where you can't get on the best like the best sellers list. No, you can't get on the great deals list if your game is less than $2 now. So do you guys I'm going to ask the chat, do you guys remember when there would be like five cent games or a game that's one cent and maybe 10 cents and they would always be number one, like number one on the best sellers list or the number one on the great deals list. Um, it was because like tens of thousands of people were buying those five cent games and they weren't making money on that, but they would make money by like being on the best sellers list after the deal ends after the discount ends. Does that make sense? Nintendo put a stop to that, and so now there's a $2 limit or else he won't show up on the charts. So yeah, maybe you've noticed all the Switch games, like they don't go below $2 anymore. So yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Those are the kind of things that change and you kind of have to move, you kind of have to, you know, just learn. And one of my favorite, here, hold on, let me show you guys. There's an awesome newsletter called the Game Discover Co. Newsletter by a guy named Simon. And this is totally free to sign. He does like uh, two or three emails a week about indie discoverability and how to get your game marketed and to get it, you know, sell copies, right? And get store features and it's all data driven. It's very number driven. And yeah, it's an email newsletter and I have learned more in those newsletters than anything out there, like more than any article. It's like a bunch of articles and they're very carefully written and data driven and sourced. Definitely sign up for that. Seriously, sign up for that uh, newsletter, Game Discover Co. He even has like a plus version where you pay a monthly fee or like maybe an annual fee and I, I pay for it because it's that good. And you get extra emails with more like, you know, bonus content and more data and stuff. So. If you guys want to learn how to market your game and maybe learn how these shops work, like discoverability wise and how to get on the front page of Steam and get featured on Switch and all those things, definitely subscribe to that newsletter. It's one of my favorites. Okay, yeah, let's, let's see how you guys are doing. Um, so I want to, this is from Blue, Bluish. So I want to eventually launch my game on console. Do you think using the new input manager, like the input action map stuff would help make input better to handle when porting? This is actually something I had to research. I've gotten this question before. Um, from what I've learned, from what I've heard, Nintendo Switch Pro Controller doesn't work, doesn't work very well with the new input manager in Unity. So it still like has some bugs to work on. This is why I prefer using a paid asset for Unity called Rewired. And I'll, almost, almost every single Unity game for Nintendo Switch uses Rewired. And it's because it has all the bugs ironed out. It works with multiplayer. It works with uh, controller vibration and everything. Rewire, they even have like, yeah, the in the documentation, they even have a section for rewired uh, and to no switch and stuff. So I would, it's like 40, 50 bucks, 100% worth it. It makes it so easy. And then your, your game will like work on every console and you could like do touch controls easier if you port to mobile. Definitely use Rewired, 100%. And maybe, maybe down the line, Unity's new input manager will work better. But Rewired is like the standard for console porting. So I would do that. Um, yeah, what else we got here? And also, guys, no spamming. I, don't, I think I have a moderator, maybe not. <laughs> but I'll put you in timeout if it, like, no one gets, not everyone gets a chance to, to ask a question and everything. Um, if I also, if I ignore a question, it might be because it breaks NDA, so I won't talk about, I like, yeah, I just got to be careful. But I'm going to talk about generalities, you know what I mean? Uh, let's see. Process for applying and publishing the consoles. What things do we need to publish the consoles being an indie studio? So to get started and to get dev kit access, um, every, like PlayStation, Xbox, and Switch, Nintendo, they have forms you fill out, and sometimes you, there's an email you have to send, like a pitch PDF, like describing your game and why your game would be, in, you know, be worth their time to, to publish on their platform. 
Um, here are the main things you do need. I'm going to just say all three consoles, keep it in you know generalities. You will need a non Gmail email address. You know, like it needs to be a business email. So maybe, you know, register a website through Squarespace and get one of the G, the Google Workspace emails. That's, you know, for me, like at the first tree.com. That's, that's my email domain. Um, for one of the platforms, you'll need a static IP address. And there's no, can't really get around that requirement. They, they require that for, you know, security purposes for accessing their development, uh, development software. And then what else? You need a registered business. Um, on mobile and Steam, you can, you can um, publish a game as a sole proprietorship or an individual. But for consoles, it's, it's the big leagues, right? So you have to, you have, to um, like have a registered business. And for the United States, I don't know what it is for other countries, but for the United States, you, that could be single member LLC. And that's a business. That's a reg registered business. And it's also it's a good idea anyway because it protects you legally. Um, yeah, it's a good idea to register a business. I didn't register a business until after the first Tree's Steam launch, or maybe right before. And like my first game was registered. Like I released my first game as an individual, so you don't have to worry about it now if you're just beginning. And I I, I hesitate telling people like to make sure to get all that legal stuff and business stuff ready. Because that can come later, and the thing I see a lot is it distracts people from finishing their game. I don't want people, like, yeah, I'd rather you finish your game than be like, oh, I need my single member LLC, I need a lawyer, I need uh, all this, I need the website, I need the domain name, you know what I mean? Like, I think that could distract you from finishing a game. And then when things start going well, um, you're seeing more success, and like it's financially worth it to hire like a lawyer or whatever, then yeah, then that's a good idea. Hopefully that helps. All right, Adam says, what do you think of publishing games on the Microsoft Store using the Creators program on ID at X or, or ID at Xbox? So I do think I like the initiative Microsoft took for the Creators program. I've, I've not heard one like financial success story. I'm sure they're there. I, but I haven't heard many financial success stories from the Creators program. And even getting on the ID at Xbox, like getting the official indie launch where it's marketed like on the Xbox like store, the Microsoft store and everything, it's still like you still might have a hard time selling copies because Xbox and PlayStation, they're, they're kind of hard. Um, you can look up postmortems like on Game of Sutra and everything and they'll talk about sometimes a console release just it won't do that well. For a while, Nintendo Switch was like a gold mine where people were selling these old indie games on Nintendo Switch, and they were selling what? Well, like they would they would mention it. Like Enter the Gungeon, I think sold seventy five thousand units in a few weeks or something, maybe a month. Yeah, that's it's slowed down too now on Switch because it's again it's getting saturated. Like we're kind of like on a time limit whenever like these big indie gold rushes happen. And I did like I did catch the end. Like I was still in the gold rush stage for the first tree when I released at the end of twenty eighteen. So I, I'm not saying that to discourage you, but just to keep your expectations realistic. Because, yeah. I'm, I just bring that up because Creators Program, I think like it's awesome opportunity like to put your game and like play it on an Xbox. I think that's cool. If you're trying to make it your full-time job, I think you're gonna need the marketing resources that the ID at Xbox people provide. And like, man, if it wasn't for them, my game, my game did actually really well on Xbox, pretty well on Xbox. And it's because I don't know, like they just, they really helped me out. They put on, they uh, marketed it for me. They put it on the Xbox main menu. If you would log on to like back in 2018 or yeah, 2019 or 2018, you'd log on to Xbox and the main menu, you'd see like a little icon for the first tree and you could learn more about it and go to the store page. And that blew my mind. I didn't ask for it. They just, they provided it because they thought the game would be interesting enough for players. And then I think Phil Spencer, the president of Xbox, he was, he was playing the first tree and everything. It was just crazy. Um, I don't think I would have gotten that exposure if I, did, if, I, if I released through the creators program. So that's my honest answer. I think it's worth it uh, chasing the idea at Xbox, going through that process instead of the, the creators program, which is a little easier. Yeah, uh, thank you. PM Lipscomb for coming. Yeah, I got a new office. It's a co-working space, so it's, I can afford it. This is, I wanted to like set up a new streaming space because 
it gets hard with three kids at my home office to stream all the time. <laughs> And this is, it's quieter and then I can focus on making my new game. And I was thinking of maybe I'll stream me making my new game in the coming, in the coming months and I'll do it more often here. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to be here. It's really, it's nice. And there's other people here, other tech startups here and there's trees. Sometimes deer will like come like just hang out. Like a few weeks ago I had a deer just laying down right here, like a giant cat next to me. And that was really cool actually. I really enjoyed it. So yeah, it's, I'm really lucky it's so close. I can bike here, which is another thing where I was like, I gotta, I gotta pay for like, you know, it's, it's not super expensive, but it still was like, is it worth the money? I could work at home, but it's nice. Just, it helps my mental, my mental health. Rohan Noel, hey David, creator Swoopy Boy here. Hey, how's it going? Finally awake for a live stream of yours. <laughs> I know I did, I, I do them usually in the morning, but I wanted to do one in the afternoon. Um, Thank you. He says I'm very motivating, and thank you. Yeah, no, good job finishing a game. My daughter loves Swoopy Boy on mobile. That, that game's fun. I still have it on my phone, actually. All right. Um, UV Raj says, how much money do we need for an LLC website? So, man, so on the first tree, I really did try to do everything on a budget because I'm was. i so I'm anti-spending. I'm, like, so risk-averse. It freaks me out to spend money. And so um, what did I do? I, I'd used WordPress instead of Squarespace or Wix because uh, uh, WordPress was cheaper. And you know, it's free. It's like open source web framework or whatever, web framework. And then um, I, I got shared hosting from hostgator.com. And that was what, like four, five bucks a month? So you still need, you need to host the website. You gotta pay for that, especially if you want your own email address and own domain name. But this was the cheapest way to do it, was get shared hosting on hostgator.com. And then I was able to get an email address through them too. And then um, you can do custom, you know, like a domain name, email alias. And then I linked that to my Gmail account. So people could email me at david at the first tree .com, but it would show up in my Gmail. And that, that was good enough. Like that got me past the requirement. And so yeah, I was probably spending six, you know, I signed up for like three years. And so it was five, four or five bucks a month using HostGator and using WordPress. Oh, and I bought a WordPress theme because I didn't want to code everything from scratch. It would have taken too long. So I got a, a $50 um, WordPress, like a nice fancy theme off themeforest.net, I think it's called. It's like the Envato marketplace. They have like a bunch of like uh, templates and stuff, like web templates, graphics and stuff. So yeah, that it costs, you know, 50 bucks plus the, the you know, the hosting. Yeah, hope that answers your question. Um, cool, this is great. Um, how important is the choice of game engine when it comes to reach on PCs and consoles? Is Godot a viable choice? There's a lot of like, Godot, there's so many like fans of Godot. Um, my main concern, this is what I've told people, is Unity is, you know, it's named Unity because it works on so many platforms. And like, I was able to self-publish my game. I, I, I did all the self-publishing. I did get help porting the game to the consoles, which was very, very hard. And that's why I had the help of Do Games. Um, and I hired them and gave them, uh, gave them a lot of money to get it working, to pass certification. And it was a long process. It took months and months and months. Um, but I was able to self-publish the game, right? Um, but anyway, I'm going on a tangent. Godot is, is cool. It's, it reminds me of Blender in the early years. And Blender, like when I first tried Blender, I was like, this sucks. I don't like it. It's just too, too user unfriendly and it's missing too many features that you know I took for granted for Unity. But now Blender is amazing. I love Blender. I would prefer Blender than Maya or, or 3D, 3D Max or whatever. So I think Godot is still maturing. I can't, I don't know if you can, actually, I just heard recently, like just recently, they were able to port, um, like the port up a, a Godot game to all three consoles. So that's pretty cool. So it, it is happening, like it's getting there. I think as a solo dev, you're gonna have so much work to do. And so the more friction you have to getting your game working on multiple platforms, 
which I don't know if Godot is there yet. I think that could hinder you. If you just want to learn Godot because you love it, you want to become a Godot expert and help, you know, maybe add features to the engine down the line, that's cool. Like, I'm not saying it's bad, but for me, what helped was having as many features and assets available as possible. And the asset store on Unity and like using things like Rewired and Easy Save 2, like those are paid assets, but they're usually cheap, like 40, 50 bucks. And those, those are the reason I was able to port and finish. Those are the, all those assets were the reason I was able to finish the game and also port the game to so many platforms. And that's why I'm like a full-time indie. You know what I mean? So do, you know, do what you do stuff that you want to for fun, like do what you're passionate about. But I do think there sometimes needs to be compromises if you're trying to make it your full-time job, if that makes sense. Relaxed Muffin says, do you personally know the voice actors or did you hire them? Well, of course I know them. It's me. <laughs> I'm trying to channel Obi-Wan Kenobi right there. Um, yeah, I did the voice acting in the first tree and my wife did. And again, it was because it was do it yourself, low budget, just, I wanted to keep it personal too, because my game is a game about family. So I did the voice acting. My wife did the voice acting in our first game. My first game, Home is Where One Starts. Um, and I might just for my next game, I think I'll just have my friends and family and keep doing it. I, I might hire someone. I, you know, I could now. I could afford it now. Back then, it was like I was a poor college student. But I like working with friends and family. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's a good question. Um, hello, what do you think of Unreal Engine 5? I, I am going to dive in soon, actually. And that's why I think I'm going to be doing some future, some next game dev streams using Unreal Engine 5. I was thinking of making it like, I was thinking of making it like Unreal Engine 5 for dummies, because I, I did use a little, I've, I'm very vaguely familiar with Unreal Engine, so I think it'd be a fun video series if I was trying to figure it out and I really like don't know what I'm doing at all and be like, okay, how do I get this cube to move? I'm like, ugh. Try to figure out blueprints and the new lumen lighting system and just, I, I want, would that be good video content if I'm like floundering in the software? I, I think it could be interesting because you're like, you're learning alongside with me, but yeah. I, I haven't messed around with Unreal Engine 5 yet and I did work in Unreal Engine 4 a little bit for um, Star Wars Secrets of the Empire when I worked at the Void. Um, but yeah, I, I want to get better at it. I feel like it's my job as a game developer to, to know all these available tools. And so I'm really excited by the potential of Unreal Engine 5. Um, before, oh, thank you. Nice t-shirt. I love Dusk. And it's made by a developer who helped me when I was first starting out, a guy named David Zymanski. He's awesome. And I love Dusk. It's seriously like one of my favorite FPS games of recent memory. Um, I did want to like talk about something. I wanted to talk about the course. Like I love talking to you guys and helping out, but this is something um, I do these videos because I hope to you know bring people to the course and help them make their first game and finish it and to succeed, right? And we've had so many amazing students like already release games. And I don't have a Patreon. I don't have a Kickstarter. I don't do sponsored videos on YouTube. Um, the course is how I'm going to be supported for the next while while I make my next game. So I did want to show you a little video of what you get in the course. And talking about the console publishing side, um, just last week I got an email from somebody who said they could never, they could not get published on Nintendo Switch. And they kept trying. And then they got the course and they were able finally to get uh, Switch dev access, which is really exciting. So I poured everything. I poured my whole, I poured years and my mental energy almost went insane making it. <laughs> but um, if you could check out this uh, test, like this, um, this little promo for the video and consider joining the amazing community, uh, that would mean a lot. Cause we have, I have 15 promo codes, discount, discount codes. And last time they went really fast. And so, yeah, if you're interested in like A to Z, like guide on how to get your game on Steam and mobile and also like consoles and including Nintendo Switch, We'd love to have you. All right, okay, let's watch this real quick. I'm proud to announce that my online school, Game Dove Unlocked, just hit version 1.0. I've put countless hours into this, and I tried my best to make it the most accessible, useful resource ever made for indie devs, new and experienced alike. Everything is covered, including coming up with the perfect game idea, mastering social media, how to reach the front page of Steam, how to publish on consoles like Nintendo Switch, and much, much more. 
I spent years polishing these videos and making them as useful as possible so your time isn't wasted digging through boring, outdated tutorials. In the Let's Dev sections, I also show you how to make a fun, casual game called Fruit Dodger in only one day without any code or artistic experience. Then we move on to the Intermediate module, where we study how to make a first-person thriller game, and you follow along to challenge slides and assignments so it's done and being sold on itch.io in only seven days. And finally, the crown jewel of my online course is the Advanced section, where I show you every step on making a beautiful exploration game just like my previous one, The First Tree. Every step is covered, including 3D modeling, environment design, sound mixing, writing a script, editing the trailer, and publishing on Steam. There's never been an online course quite as complete as GDU. We'd also love to have you join what my students consider the best game dev community they've ever been in. There's no judgment here, only kindness, encouragement, and useful advice. If you enroll now, you can get some special bonuses before they run out. Perks include eight free Steam keys, discounts on tons of valuable assets, and an exclusive student discount for Adobe Creative Cloud, which includes tools like Photoshop. There's lots more I could show you, but I wanted to give you a heads up and let you know how much we'd love to have you join our community. There's never been a better time to jump into game development, even as a complete noob, and I can't wait to see what you create. Check out the coupon code in the video description to get started, and I will see you there. Thanks for watching that, guys. We'd love to have you join. Um, and also, we just added a free Autodesk software like Maya. You can get the student like education version for free, which is awesome. And I'm adding new mobile publishing videos. So yeah, um, thanks for watching that. Uh, the price is not monthly. It's a one-time fee, and it's you know lifetime membership. And I'm adding more stuff. I wanted to add. I was talking to the students earlier about adding an Unreal section because that's been a complaint I've received. So I want to add, I just want it to be like a one-stop shop of everything game development, including making trailers and, and publishing on mobile and then getting on console and marketing, like all that stuff. Like I just noticed that all the other online courses, they don't, they don't go into that stuff as much. And so I wanted to make something that was complete. So yeah, um, how much is it? It's got a 40% off coupon. I think it's different according to the currency, but it's like a 200 to $300 with the coupon. Depends on like, I think like taxes and stuff from where your country is. Um, yeah, oh, and we have, I saw a few of our students here, like Jeff and Lady Vanta Black and Cliff. Thanks for joining, guys. Um, and yeah, I, I've seen Jeff, he's been posting a lot of the Unreal stuff, it looks awesome. Like I'm really excited to try out Unreal, because I that's, all, that's what I'm obsessed with, is forest, like foggy forest with lots of volumetric light and um, I don't know, I love exploration games. It just looks very cinematic. And I love cinem cinema, you know, cinematic, story-driven, beautiful games. And so that's, yeah, I, I don't know. I might make my next game in Unreal Engine 5. First, I gotta mess around with it, but yeah, I'm, I'm, really, I'm excited for the future. And yeah, that was my wife recording. Um, yeah, we'd love to have you guys. And if not, that's okay. Um, there's like free stuff on the website too. Uh, you can join like the new, the GDU newsletter for like free asset pack and stuff. Okay, cool. Um, what else can I can I help you guys with? This is fun. It's it's nice I can do this in my office now instead of setting up the camera and lights in my in my home office and everything. I'm gonna leave like this stuff up so I can just stream easier and stream faster and everything. Um, okay, for an indie dev, which marketplace do you recommend to start with first? PlayStation, Xbox, or Nintendo? Um, so. If you want, if you want your game just on a console, um, I would recommend uh, Xbox, the market, like the game creators marketplace, because you don't need to go past certification. It's like a light version of certification, and I think you can upload a Universal Windows program, a, a UWP, which is easy to generate from Unity. Um, that would get your game on Xbox. Now, maybe that wasn't your question. You're thinking, well, like, what should I start with to start making money and like making like a living uh, when porting the console and everything? And it's like, it's still like, it is more saturated on Switch, but it's still no contest. Indies do the best on Switch, like by far. Um, I'm trying to think how detailed I can get with sales numbers. I've kind of like, I've shared stuff on Twitter before and I haven't been told this was against the rules. 
Um, Nintendo Switch has done the best for me. Xbox has done second best, and then PlayStation's done third. And you know, PlayStation still did fine. Um, I think what really helped Xbox was I was featured on the main menu on the Xbox dashboard, and that really that really helped. You know what? The big thing, something I think about a lot now, is these these game subscription services. And I'm telling you, it's going to shift the whole industry. And sometimes I wonder if like, I won't even be able to sell my next game like as a one-time product. I sometimes think it's going to be more like uh, I'm going to sell exclusivity rights to Xbox Game Pass or to Epic Game Store or to the PlayStation subscription service that will probably come sometime. I don't know. Uh, these subscription services, like I think of you know games turning into Netflix or an Amazon Prime and like... Those companies, they put all their money and resources into exclusives because that's, that's how you get people to come to your platform and subscribe to their monthly fee. I think that's how people, I think that's how indie game devs are going to make money in the future is making a really great game and you market it, you know, you post it on Twitter and Reddit and people are like, you get a lot of views on your trailer and then you'll get approached by an Xbox Game Pass representative and they'll be like, hey, can we pay you a big fat, you know, give you a big fat bag of money if you put this as a Game Pass exclusive? I think that will, that's where that market's heading, I would say. Um, yeah, good, good question. Um, repping the Dusk shirt. <laughs> I'm glad you guys like it. I, I wanted to wear it just because I thought you guys would like it too, and I, I love Dusk. Um, yeah, how, how else are you guys doing? So it's possible to make a bestseller without a single line of code. Yeah, like I don't know if the first tree is like a bestseller, like it's nothing compared to like Stardew Valley and Hollow Knight. But did I write, did I write, like, I don't know, to be totally, totally transparent, I probably wrote like a dozen lines of code. Like I'd have to edit like a line of code. I'd use like the third person controller by Opsieve and I'd be like, oh, the jumping's not working. So I'd spend like a day like trying to get the code working right for like the ray casting. So I would, there's like a few lines of code, but no, the first tree is almost completely done by Playmaker, which is finite state machine, visual scripter. Um, and it did like it, it sold way more than I anticipated. So I guess, if you consider that a bestseller, then yes, I did a bestseller, bestselling game. I guess actually I could technically call the first tree bestselling because it's on the Switch bestsellers list right now. <laughs> it's on the download only, like uh, space number 30 in the United States, but it's there. Um, last, last sale, or maybe it was the, the sale before last on Nintendo Switch, I did get on the f official uh, bestsellers list on Switch at number 16, which was really cool. That, that game, it was doing really well right then. Why, why did it get so high? That might have been the first time I discounted the game to like 70% off on Switch. And then something crazy happened. This was an accident. And this, this brought in a lot, you know, enough money, you know, to help sustain our family for a while and we could save it for the future. I accidentally, I didn't plan on this, but I put the first tree on sale right in the middle of the COVID-19 lockdown. So when, when did lockdown start for the world? It was like March, right? March 2020. Um, yeah, it was like 30, 40% off right at the beginning of lockdown. It was right when Animal Crossing came out. Because Animal Crossing was a pandemic game, right? And it got, I think that was the time, maybe that was the time it got into like number 16 bestsellers list on Switch. And yeah, it did very well because so many people were buying games. Everyone was like, okay, gotta stay inside all day. Let's buy some Switch games. And you know, I'm not gonna lie, I felt like a twinge of guilt because I had friends that were not in this, that industry and they were having like the worst time of their lives and they were losing their jobs and their companies were getting shut down. And I was having like the most lucrative sale ever. <laughs> it's just crazy how that works out. Um, my, my, my friends are good now though, they, they got through it, but it's really strangely fortunate. A little bit of, little bit of guilt, I guess. Uh, Mr. Devin Parson says, would you say most of your sales come from discounted sales? Oh yeah. Like when the game is not on sale, and I'll talk about Steam. When a game on Steam isn't on sale, I probably sell about five to 10 units a day. And so after taxes and after returns and then after VAT, you know, and Steam's cut, I'm probably making maybe 40, $50 a day. You know, like I can't, I can't raise a family on that. But when it's discounted, 
on Steam, you're, you're selling potentially hundreds or thousands of units a day. It makes a huge difference. Like people, people just, there's so many games out there, they won't buy a game unless it's discounted already. You know what I mean? So yeah, you have to put your games, you have to discount them consistently, especially on consoles. That helps a lot. Um, Anubis says, without a single line of code is great, but what about model arts and graphics? Yeah, like I used Maya and Photoshop um, for the first tree. I used a lot of that. I used After Effects for stuff too. I like I made I made a lot of stuff, but also you have to remember I finished the game so fast because I used the asset store a lot, and that was like that's kind of the big thing about Game Dev Unlocked is you can use these assets without making an asset flip game. That was my goal, and I tried to modify it, give it my own creative flavor, my own creative touch. And I was able to save a lot of time because I wasn't reinventing the wheel, especially for art assets. Um, I didn't compose the music. Like I, I used, um, I licensed the music from a composer who, who like sold their music on stock music websites. Yeah, the, it, I don't, re you know, that was the reason I was able to finish my game. If I had to make everything from scratch, I wouldn't have finished it and the game would have never, I would have never had a life-changing launch, you know what I mean? I am a huge proponent of using the asset, asset store. And it was kind of funny because there was like this attitude of like, no, don't, you can't use assets. Like, or what are you like, a, what are you, you know, you're just like a sellout, you're like a, a liar about your craft. And it's like, no, no, it's not about that. And then I realized I talked to other devs, like I went to GD, GDC and then I started learning like how many of the same assets I was using they were used in huge indie mega hits like Firewatch and Hollow Knight. Do you know Hollow Knight used Playmaker? Um, Inside uses, Inside used to, yeah. All these Unity games, I'm just saying, a lot of them use tons of assets, including art assets. And they usually modify them a bit. And I don't know, coming from a film background too, you don't notice it, but you won't believe how many sets and sound effects and costumes are reused. You just don't notice it but they do that because it's smart production. So I'm really glad I used the Asset Store. And I wanna see more developers use the Asset Store because it means they'll be able to finish their games faster. And sometimes it means, this is something they say you know, at Pixar, it's like we need to learn to fail faster so we can get the, the right idea, the idea that resonates with hundreds of thousands of gamers. And so you need to fail fast. And that's what the Asset Store can do is you can finish a game and fail fast so that you can find the next big success. So I, lo I love the asset store, and I think every developer should use more assets. Um, what's your opinion about so Somerville? Oh, I loved it. I love Inside by Playdead. It's one of my favorite games of all time. I love that game. I, I replay it often, and I, I almost never replay games. I only, play, I only replay Stalker and Inside. <laughs> That's the only two games I really replay all the time. Um, and Stalker 2 looked pretty good. I'm worried it's gonna be more linear like Metro 2033, but Stalker, like that, that brand of open world games is my, my favorite game ever. And I love Inside, I love Limbo. So yeah, Somerville I'm excited about. Um, Stalker 2, I'm excited for 12 minutes. What else? You know me, I'm just, I'm a story driven uh, game kind of nerd. That's what I'm obsessed with. So I'm excited for all those games. Um, Oh, thank you. Congrats, bro, for being bestseller. Thank you. I'm really fortunate. This is like the fourth time I think I've hit the Switch bestsellers list. And eventually it will run out because I'm getting to the end of my discount range. And as like I talked about at the beginning, um, the discount, you can only do $2 now. Up, like you can only do, you can, it can only be $2 if you want it to show up on the charts on Nintendo Switch. So I'm at $2.50. So maybe I have one more time left for it to get a little bit more traction on, on Switch. And then I've kind of maxed out the discount. So yeah, just taking it slow. That's what Valve recommends too, is to step, like do a like step by step, um, take your discounts down by like five, 10% each time. If you go straight to 50%, then that you could be losing potentially a lot of sales. Jal Dev Game says, okay, suppose my game is ready now. All I need is to publish it on PlayStation. How much time will it take to get my game published on PlayStation if my development is done today? So here's, I'm gonna give you a reality check. I'm not trying to be mean. <laughs> my game was done. 
on Steam and I'd ironed out all these bugs. I'd added rewired compatibility with the controls. It should have been like ready for, it should have been, oh, and I got the save system working so it should, it would, should have been theoretically easy to put it on console. Um, it took, oh geez, how long did it take? It took like five months. It, it's a lot of work, like starting from nothing and having to get like, you know, getting your publishing credentials set up on PlayStation and your developer account set up, buying a dev kit, getting this, getting a static IP address set up so that you can access the developer resources on the web, um, submitting your game to uh, certification, um, trying to get it like, you know, passing their quality assurance and then failing. And then you have to do it again. You have to go to the back of the line, which takes forever. Yeah, it takes, I would, in fact, I, I saw a GDC talk recently where they said, yeah, you should budget six months into porting a game. And if it has network, like multiplayer capabilities, budget in a year, a year just to port your indie game to console. So yeah, that's the honest truth. It will take a while, but you know, like I've said, porting to, to consoles was definitely worth it. And I'm really glad I did it, but it was really, it was like I've said, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my career easily all right b wolf what are your opinions on getting a publisher versus kickstarter for solo devs um this is something this is interesting because you know i talked to thomas brush a bit and we had like kind of different paths to game development i my strategy was okay like shave off time so that you can work on your game um, at, at night, like moonlight, moonlight being a game dev and then work on weekends and keep your day job. So if your game fails, which it might, it will probably fail financially. It won't make enough money to replace your day job, but you still have your day job and you're safe. Like you're fine. Like you, you will have enough money to survive and you won't get, you know, you won't be homeless or whatever. Uh, Thomas brush, he was, he, he really wanted to, um, he wanted to get, you know, he wanted to be a full-time indie developer as, as soon as possible. And so the way to do that is to work with a publisher and they give you an advance and they'll say, all right, we'll give you, we'll give you this amount of money so that you can live, you can live off of it, like buy food and pay your rent. And then you can spend all your time working on the game. And you know what? I, you're asking me which is better. Um, I don't think, I don't think one way is better than the other. I think it depends on your personality. For me, I'm very risk averse, and I even though a publisher can like help uh, alleviate that risk, I was still scared it would it wouldn't work out. Like I just wanted I wanted the first tree to be bonus money. I remember like making Home is Where One Starts, and all I wanted was like enough money to buy a new graphics card when I released the game, and it did do that. I was able to buy a new computer and bought a nice bought a 980 Ti for like 600 bucks, which I'd never bought anything that expensive before. And it was fun to say, oh, my game paid for that. that. To me, that was rewarding. That was like, that worked for me. Some people, they want to work on their game full time. And, and that's, that, that's totally valid, valid way to do it. Um, another thing you have to keep in mind, I was approached by AAA publishers for the first tree. And it scared, it scared the crap out of me, actually. I was like, oh my gosh, like this could be big. And they just found my game through Twitter and Reddit and Imager because I was trying to do marketing, which I encourage people to do. You can't, you have to market nowadays. But as I was marketing the game, I'd have, I get emails from people like huge. I don't, I don't know if I should say it, but they make games you've definitely heard of. And I was like, Hey, we're interested. Um, we should talk. And I remember talking to my wife about it. I was like, what do I do? Like this, this could be, this could be huge. And it scared me because having a publisher could also mean it could also mean that you have someone to answer to and that they're going to hold your feet to the fire and again my personality was like that was too stressful for me like i wanted my hobby game to stay a hobby game and i didn't want to like have like to send a demo build to a publisher and the publisher would be like Ugh, this level sucks you need to fix this that was like a nightmare to me i just did not want to do that i was you know, I had my day job for that. I, I, was, I wasn't going to turn my hobby, fun, creative project into like make my, you know, give myself a boss. You know what I mean? And I know like there's good publishers out there that give you full creative control. 
I, I imagine even if you did have full creative control, they'd still be like, if your game was really bad, they'd still be like, ooh, we're kind of worried. I think you need to, you need to fix this stuff, but I know we can't force you, but we're really kind of scared. And that kind of like stressed me out. <laughs> I liked keeping it like I was the creative director, I was the publisher. That was very freeing to me and it really made me happy. So yeah, you got, yeah, I said no to that AAA publisher, which was crazy. Um, and I think it was the right call because right now I'm still, I'm still very independent. Um, I don't know. I've told Thomas I've, I'd consider a publisher just because I'm tired of doing the stuff I don't like, which is marketing. I don't want to market. It'd be nice to have a publisher with more resources so they could publish my game for me on, on Switch. I proved to myself I could do it. I self-published my game and I did something else I did, which I don't think very many indie developers do, is I published in Japan on console, which was very hard. I had to hire translators because I couldn't understand literally any of the emails to the Japanese government trying to get my game rated. But that was something I'm really proud of. Like I was able to do it. Now, I don't know if I want to do it again, but <laughs> I did it. And that was important to me. Yeah, Jordan asking, would you self-publish again if you had the chance? And that's a, yeah, I'm actually kind of on the fence because publishing on console is hard. And I'm glad I was able to do it. That was kind of a, that was kind of like a self-inflicted goal, self, self-motivated goal I wanted to do. But, you know, as your business grows and as your revenue grows, you're able to outsource some of the stuff that you just don't want to do. And so I think about that a lot. I'm like, oh, maybe I should hire a publisher or hire a marketer. But yeah, I've just been such a penny pincher in the past, which I do think indie developers should penny pinch because it's expensive making games. It takes a lot of time and you want to try to get your revenue back, you know, your investment back. Because, yeah, I spent probably $400, $500 making Home is Where One Starts, my first game. And then the first tree, I spent $10,000 making it. So of course I was like, my biggest concern was like, am I gonna make my $10,000 back? That's what I was really worried about. And it worked out, I'm, I'm lucky. Jordan says, I've seen a lot of posts on game devs reddits lately where beautiful art, tons of wish lists, bad launch. It's definitely scary. It is, you're, you're not wrong. Um, yeah, the, the wish lists, they, they should correlate with a good launch. And sometimes they don't, and that's probably because, that's probably because um, they're low quality wish lists. And sometimes people try to like, you know, try to earn lots of wish lists through like Steam giveaways and stuff like that. I don't know. Um, you wanna try, you know, it takes time to market and to find that audience because you want high quality wish lists, and that means it will take longer to gather that kind of audience, but they'll be high quality. And that's what I think the first tree, you know, being honest, I think that's what it did well. Is like they were high quality, high quality wish lists. And it's just, it was just from a year, like months and months of just trying to find those people who would like a game like that. But yeah, that, yeah, I could talk about prologue games and how you make a free game on Steam now. And then you try to have, have people wish list it. Um, the full game and that 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 was working for a while. I don't know if it's working now anymore. Maybe maybe a little bit <clears throat> Bjorn says so you used playmaker. Why did you choose that and not bolt for an exam for for example? Um, so bolt wasn't available back then um, and also I've tried bolt and I Yet to remember I come from a filmmaking background and so human readable language is really important to me. Like I, you know, like I know like a little bit about using a little bit of code to make computer software do stuff. Like I, I used After Effects and you learn expressions, which is like a form of JavaScript to like animate stuff or whatever. But you have to remember like in After Effects, you just search in an effects list to get, to get a video clip to do something, right? And if you want to move something, you know, you just keyframe a position tab. You know what I mean? There's no these, there's no lurping and slurping and tweening. That was just like a foreign language to me. So that's why I liked Playmaker because it really was a human readable language. And the idea of like a finite state machine where it's like you're in a state and then you transition to another state, like I understood that, like it made perfect sense. And I know there's a lot of people like code makes perfect sense to them. And that's awesome. Like you, you have a gift, you have a gift then. <laughs> that's, that's not me. I'm still not much of a coder. 
Um, I've tried Bolt, and I pretty much think it's just coding C sharp with a mouse. And honestly, like you're still having to deal with the syntax, the weird idiosyncrasies of programming. Like, I don't know. I remember trying, like, I just wanted, I was trying to learn to code when I first picked up Unity, and it was like, I had to, t I had to like type in wait for seconds. I wanted to just wait five seconds and then play a sound. Um, and I just like, I, you know, you Google it and it's like, well, duh, you got to use a coroutine. It's like, I didn't know what a coroutine was. Like, it still, still doesn't make total ton of sense. So that's why Playmaker really, it just, you type in wait and then you can type in three seconds, then you wait. It just made perfect sense to me. But I know not everyone's that way and you got to do what works for you. But yeah, I love Playmaker and I'm going to use a blueprints, I think, in Unreal Engine. Definitely I'm not doing C. No thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, we got Song of Iron, which I think I recognize your game. Thanks, thanks for watching the stream. I uh, would love to hear about the pains around ratings for different regions. Oh, yeah. So consoles, you need to rate your game. And just recently, they came out with a new system for rating games across all these different countries in the world called iARC. And what's cool about iARC is it's free, and you just you self-rate yourself, and you just say... Like, you know, how scary is your game? How violent is your game? Is there profanity in your game? And then it will give you a rating automatically, and then you get the certificates. Um, iARC is when I was publishing my game in 2018, iARC was not available for PlayStation in Europe. And so that meant I had to pay thousands of dollars, and I had to go to the Peggy website, and I had to uh, send them a build. Uh, did I have to send? You might have to like mail a DVD. I'm trying to remember. I did it all by myself, by the way. It was really hard. <laughs> but I wanted to release my game in Europe, you know, in PlayStation, on PlayStation. That was really important to me. And then, so that was, I think, like, I, I actually don't know, but I think iARC, I think iARC is definitely in place for PlayStation of America, Sony of America. You can use iARC, which is easy. You get your rating and you can go, it's really fast. Um, Europe, I don't know if they have iARC yet for Sony. I, they might actually, they might've just added it. Uh, something you absolutely cannot skip is if you wanna release in Japan, you need a zero rating from the Japan government. And this was the thing I'm proud of because it took a lot of energy and a lot of resources and I needed to hire a lot of translators. But since I self-published my game, I had to manually submit um, my game to Japan to get that. I wanted to get the zero rating so that I could release on Switch in Japan and PlayStation in Japan. You didn't need it for Xbox in Japan. Um, they had like a self-rating system there. Um, but I did that, and I kid you not, they asked like if you can mail a VHS tape of footage of your game. But then I think I, uh, I clarified and they said I could mail a DVD. <laughs> Um, so I, I had to make, I had to get a DVD burner cause I didn't really have one. And I had to do an hour long footage of my game with the Japanese subtitles. And I submitted that to the Ciro, the game rating board. And then, yeah, that cost, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the cost. It cost thousands of dollars. Um, and I did that and I was able to get the rating and then, yeah, then I was able like, you just, you just get a little PDF and then you can add that to the console publishing websites and then you can publish in Japan and, or, uh, in Japan on PlayStation or switch. So yeah, that was, that's the truth. Um, I was thinking if maybe one day I'll talk at GD, GDC again, and I was thinking my topic maybe could be about self-publishing on every platform and talk about all those little things like I just said, like how to publish in Japan as a solo dev and how to um, publish in PlayStation Europe as a solo dev and all those little things. It, it might be useful. I don't know, it might have too much um, confidential information, but I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if I even wanna speak at GDC again, but I've thought about it. <laughs> um, honestly, like, yeah, you're welcome, Song of Iron. I would say the increase in sales, like my game specifically, it featured a fox, and foxes are really important to Japanese culture, and that's why I made the extra effort to publish there. Um, 
like I kept getting like I was featured in like the huge gaming magazines in Japan and I was like I need I need I need my game there that could be huge and it was worth it my game is sold decent like very it's been well it was worth my time to publish in Japan on consoles I I don't know if it's totally worth it if your game doesn't like reach out to like a specific cultural you know cultural important point and you know for me, it was foxes and the Japanese culture. They really loved foxes, and so the game sold well. If your game doesn't have any of that thing that might like appeal to a Japanese audience, I don't know if it's worth all that effort to like hire a translator and go through the rating process to, just to release in Japan, like on Switch or PlayStation. So yeah, it might not be worth the time and effort. But for me, I think it, it did work out because just because my game's topic of foxes, it's it's that simple. Enrique, easy money. Next game about a koi fish. <laughs> That's great. How many people we have? Oh, we got 91 people. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Um, yeah, what else we got here? David, have you tried Game Creator for Unity? What's Game Creator? Is it like an asset? Is it like, are you talking about the Game Creator thing for Nintendo Switch? Because I saw that. I saw a trailer for it, and I thought it looked cool. I wanted to bring my Switch just to show you guys, like, hey, guys, look. It's on the bestsellers list. But then I was about to take it from my house, and my daughter started crying because she was going to play Super Mario 3D World on it. So I was like, okay, fine. I won't, I won't bring the Switch. You can play it during the afternoon. So you guys have to imagine, and hopefully this gets more engagement and likes on the video. Hey, imagine I got my Switch right here, and it's, you're looking at the top sellers list. <laughs> um, all right, what else we got here? Should I launch my first game on itch? I love itch.io. I think it's amazing. It's so easy. It's by far, I've, I've published on every platform. Itch is the easiest. Um, it, it is, you know, here's the thing. Steam is where you can make a living off your game. I don't think anyone has like really quite made a living off selling a game on itch. Io, especially since so many games are free or name your own price. So this is what I recommend and I talk about in the course. Like make your first game, make it fast, use the asset store, and I, I walk you through the whole process in the Let's Dev Intermediate section. And then we publish it together on itch.io and you could choose to ask like for a dollar or do name your own price. And that just gets over this mental hurdle of like saying like, oh my game needs to be perfect, I need to release it on Steam. Just release a game. And just releasing a game, it will like it will help you feel more confident. You'll get that motivational boost because streamers and YouTubers like they'll post videos of them playing your game, and they're almost always nice. And they're like, "Thanks for making this game. This was awesome." And it just gets you excited. I wouldn't have finished the first tree if I hadn't made my first game, which didn't do that great. In fact, Home is Where One Starts. I never intended to release it on Steam. It was only going to be an itch.io game, and I was going to do name your own price. And then as I started working on it, I was like, I'm going to, like, to me, it was a big deal at the time. I was like, I'm going to spend a hundred dollars on Steam Greenlight. And that was scary. I was like, I was a poor college student. I was like, I do not want to spend a hundred bucks and not get it back. But I was like, I'm going to try it out. I'm going to try it out. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad I did for Home is Where One Starts because it did make, in its lifetime, it made about $10,000. That was like after bundles and everything. Alex, oh, you must be part of the course. Thanks for joining the course, Alex. To be honest, I'm a little afraid to start the advanced part of the course, mainly because I don't want to spend any more money right now. How would you approach it from a student's perspective? Yeah, if you're on a budget, that's understandable. And I guess I would encourage you to find free asset replacements, which you can search in the Unity Asset Store and like type in wolf or animal or dog or whatever. If you need, like, we use a coyote cub in the course for the advanced module where we make a game that's really similar to the first tree and publish it on Steam. Um, but yeah, if you don't have the budget, of course, you know, I think you can still make it work, though. You'll just use different assets. You'll have to buy some of them. Like, I don't think there's a way around buying the third-person controller, but that's why I have, like, a student discount in the course and stuff. Um, the reason, though, Something, yeah, I, I spent $10,000 on the first tree, 
And the cool part was that I didn't spend any of that money from my own pocket from my day job. That was all home is where one starts, my first game. That was all home is where one starts revenue. So to me, it was like, oh, I just broke even if the first tree failed because I'd only spent my game earnings from my first game. And so you could, as, as a student, GDU student, you could um, publish your intermediate game and try to market it and really try to put it out there and sell it on Steam where you'll probably make a lot more money than itch.io. I'm not promising you'll make tens of thousands of dollars, but if you marketed it and followed the principles in the course, I bet you could sell 1000 2000 You can get $2,000, $3,000. No guarantees, of course, but I think you could. And then you can use that money to buy all the stuff in the advanced module for your next game, because that's kind of how I did it. So yeah, hope that makes sense. Toby says, is the first tree available on Android? Yes, it is. I actually just yesterday, I finished a video for the course about Android publishing and how to port your game to Android. So, so yeah, um, that was really hard. Um, this, this I can tell you. The Android is by far my worst performing platform by a huge mile, like, yeah, long mile. Um, I probably won't publish games to Android anymore unless it's free to play with ads or in-app purchases. That's just like, that's kind of like the ecosystem. That's the culture of the platform is it's like, if it's a paid game, people aren't gonna buy it. <laughs> iOS, App Store on the other hand, especially if your game is artistic and like beautiful and story driven, those games do really well on iOS, and publishing on iOS was a great decision. It's made, it's, it's on track to do just as well as my, my, you know, my console releases, except Switch. Switch is, <laughs> Switch is the reason I'm a full-time indie developer. Hence my thumbnail and the video title. I'm on number like 30. I'm number 30 of 30 on the downloads only bestsellers list. <laughs> Um, I'm hoping in a few days, um, because game sales always spike on the weekend. Huge spikes every weekend. I'm hoping I get a little higher on the list before the sale runs out. So yeah, if you guys don't have the first tree on Switch, um, please, you know, you can support me there. That, I'd appreciate that. I think it's $2.50, or the equivalent of your country's currency. Um, Freddie says, where can I send a game that I'm making for you to play? You know, I. I appreciate you guys want my feedback. I get so many emails. I got so many emails I had to step back and I was tempted to like take off my contact info on every single platform because it just was too much. It was like kind of a huge learning and growing experience for me because I'm just getting that fire hose of information of people that need help. It was kind of overwhelming. So I try to do these Q and A's though to help you guys and give back, but having individual emails of everyone's games they wanted to play, I just, I just don't have time and I, I apologize. I was playing students games um, in, in GDU in the online course, but now I've combined that with everything and we just do a member stream where I can look at the games, look at a Steam store page, answer questions. So kind of just do it all like once a month in our monthly streams for the course. So, and here's the, here's the other thing. I've, I've thought a lot about this because I get a lot of people that are like, please play my game. And you know, I try to look at them. I look at all of them. It's just opening up a game and playing and installing it. I just have so much to do. But my feedback, I don't think is as important as you think because as you know, you're creating a product and you need your customer's feedback. That's what matters. And having another game developer play a game, like it can be fun, and you know you can get like you know you can get feedback from like a different set of you know different perspective. But it honestly, like it, I don't know if I don't know if it's that's as valuable as having a ton of customers play in a beta round, people who actually really want to play your game, and they're the ones that want to spend money and buy your game, and you, the, their perspective, like customers' feedback, is what matters, not other developers as much. Um, you can get just you can get more valuable feedback from all your customers than I think from other developers in my personal opinion. And something to keep in mind, um, developers, you know, they do know like they know like the technical stuff. They'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, the, the ray casting, I think it needs to go off sooner. I think the physics are a little too floaty, increase the gravity. Um, that could be helpful. But customers, here's what I've noticed with customer feedback. They're almost always right when they say something is wrong, and they're almost always wrong. Um, 
let me rephrase that. Customers are almost always right if something isn't working for them in the game, and they're almost always wrong when they try to explain what's causing that, if that makes sense. So yeah, getting just a list of complaints about your game from customers and maybe ignoring their like, oh, yeah, like oh, it was really frustrating level one, you need more enemies. Like I would ignore that part. But them saying I had a problem with level one, that's really good data. That can really help you a lot to like figure out how to make the game a more enjoyable experience. And then you can dig into it and maybe have your developer friends be like, what's wrong with level one? Yeah, hope that makes sense. All about translating the feedback, yeah. That's something I've heard from a lot of artists is, yeah, a customer's knee-jerk reaction is really valuable. It's very good data. Uh, uh, let's see, Anshul Kumar says, can a publisher do the porting work of your game to console for you? Yes, I worked with Do Games. In fact, I wanted to, I'm not, this video's not sponsored or anything. I just love Do Games. Here, what, how do we get here? Right, monitor. Um, Do Games is, uh, they're the porting studio that helped me. And look at all these awesome games. Art of Rally had a big launch video recently. They did good. Manifold Garden, Where the Water Tastes Like Wine. East Shade, released on Xbox and PlayStation. There's me, the first tree, pinstripe. Um, I love Do Games, and it's because, uh, it's yeah, it's run by a guy named Matt and his team. They're just so smart and polite and brilliant. And I wouldn't have been able to pass certification without Do Games' help. And here's the cool thing. Here's the thing I wanted to show. And it's something Matt has been telling me about for a long time. And I was, I was waiting for it to happen. I don't know if it's on this page. Where is it? Oh, wait, yeah, services. So they, so normally you could hire a publisher. You could hire a publisher to like port your game and get it running and everything. And they would do all the work. You give them like your source files through GitHub or whatever. Um, but what if there was a suite, a library of scripts that interfaced with Unity and they did all the porting work for you. So like it was, it was, it worked for all three consoles. And so you could get, let's see, you know, like cloud saving is different on Xbox and on PlayStation and on Switch, all that stuff. Is there cloud saving on Switch? I'm not sure about that. But anyway, you know what I mean, like controller vibration. Let's say controller vibration. What if you could call one method in the code for controller vibration and it would work on all three consoles? Um, that's what Matt and the people at Do Games have done. It's a self-service product and it's coming soon and you can sign up for their early access pretty much. And this just blows my mind because you don't even need a dev kit. Imagine like you don't ever need a dev kit and it does everything for you and you can just you can sign up for publishing on PlayStation and then just submit your game and it will pass certification. To me, that's a miracle product. I would have literally spent tens of thousands of dollars for that if that was available um, back when I was making the first tree. Uh, and I did hire do games, um, but just to be able to do it like as a self-service product and you don't need to hire a bunch of programmers to do it for you. Like it's the scripts all work in Unity already. And I think it works, maybe it works in Unreal and stuff. I'm not sure. So yeah, and I think you could hire them too. Um, and I think they're doing publishing now, which is really exciting. Publishing is the hard part, or it's, I don't know. To me, certification was the super hard part. Um, publishing, it was, it, was, it was a lot of work, but it was possible. <laughs> um, I love do games. In the online course, I talk a lot about console porting and publishing and how to find the right publisher because here's the cool thing. There are hybrid publisher porting studios that not only will port your game, but they'll publish it for you. And so they'll just give you, you just have to sit back, you know, you just be like, ah, here's my source code. And you just hand it to them. And then they give you, they give you like a royalty check from their earnings. Cause they, they will earn the money. It will go into their account cause they publish the game. But that's, that's easy. And that's in the online course, if you're interested in switch in like console porting, I have a huge list of the best people to work with who've had the most success with. If you're interested in just handing it over to a porting, porting slash publishing hybrid company, if that makes sense. Oh, how long have we been doing this? Okay, an hour and 10 minutes. This is great. Yeah, what a, let's see what you guys are saying. 
Um, could you please talk about a bit, a bit about visibility rounds on Steam? Come in handy for your game on Steam. Yes, visibility rounds, especially for games that are like games as a service. And I'm talking more like multiplayer games where you, you know, they want more features and they want new levels and everything. Visi visibility rounds are key. Um, the best way to use a visibility round, and this is universal, is you get a big update or else you can't use a visibility round. And then you time it. You have to time it with a big sale. And then you can do like the week-long specials that you can set in Steam. And so just time that update with the visibility round and then time it with a big sale. And then people who've wishlisted your game will get a little notification and will say 50% off. Oh, and new features. And you'll get, you'll get a lot of sales. That's the best way to, to maximize the visibility round effectiveness for sure. Um, Jordan says, did you create an LLC before publishing to Steam? I think, what did I do? Um, uh, my first game was not. Uh, no LLC. It was a sole proprietorship or individual. And then I think it might have been after, I might have done it right before launch of the first tree. I was like, okay, I have time. Um, the game's mostly done. I'm going to form a business. And that helps. That's probably the wisest thing to do. Um, but you, I asked, I actually asked Valve this. I was like, is it easy to convert from like a sole proprietorship to a company? And they're like, yeah, they just, they just flip a switch. Um, it's not that big of a deal. So it is like, that's the right way to do things, of course. The legal, that's what a lawyer would say, like, you gotta do it that way. Um, and this isn't legal advice, by the way. <laughs> but um, if, if like you're getting worried about legal stuff and having a business form, if that's getting in the way of finishing your game, I would not worry about it. It's not, I think you'll be fine. That's my theory. <laughs> um, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I'd worry about finishing your game. And I'd worry more about stuff getting in the way of you finishing your game, if that makes sense. Um, Philip says, what do you think about stuff like publisher contracts being more public? Oh, I loved it. That was such like a game changer to me. That was huge. Like I think of the company Raw Fury, um, really nice, really amazing publisher. They're publishing some huge games. Um, what comes to mind from them? Backbone, that raccoon new war game came out by Raw Fury. And then also Sable, that beautiful, amazing desert exploration game um, that just released on the demo released on Xbox a few days ago. Raw Fury released all of their public contracts. Here, let's, why don't we, let's take a look for fun. P Publisher. Why we are publishing Raw Fury's publishing agreements. Man, this was so crazy. And then they challenged everyone on Twitter to do the same and say like, hey, share your terms. And it was like this amazing act of transparency that I just don't think it would have happened in another industry. Gaming, gaming's kind of different. We're just kind of, we try to look out for each other, even though I guess technically we're competitors. You know what I mean? Um, you could, where is it? Where can you download it all? Dev resources page, access developer resources. Here it is. It's all on Dropbox for you to look at. Do you know, you know you have to sign NDAs to look at these NDA <laughs> covered documents. You know what I mean? Um, the publishing agreement was interesting. I can't believe this stuff is just open for you to see. I've signed a lot of agreements like this and I could never just reveal what I signed. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> and it also like it got some criticism like I think the maker who was it maybe like the other half of Lambeer software you know they did like ridiculous fishing and stuff I think he he, he went through it with a pen and just was like this is bad this is bad this means they can throw a yacht party with all their marketing budget and there's nothing you can do about it <laughs> At the same time, though, I do understand that you have to trust your publisher a little bit. You know what I mean? You have to, like, trust them and say, like, hey, I know you're not going to throw a yacht party with all the mar mar marketing budget. <laughs> um, what did they say? I think what they do. Yeah, here we go. Oh, yeah, this is, like, a developer refunding repayment. Where's, like, I think it was 50-50. That was the publishing revenue share, which is different for each publisher, but 50-50. 
like knowing that number is just that's a big deal you know what i mean um i think you guys should check it out here i'm gonna post it in the chat definitely check that out i just there's even stuff like they're hiring like they're hiring like papers when they get an employee or a contractor like i paid i got i had the I paid for papers like that, like to help protect myself legally, and I paid a lawyer thousands of dollars to do that. And it's like you could take look, take a look at their stuff if you want. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's interesting. The contract, yeah, Chow said this contact because this contract after the notes from the guy from Vlambeer is frightening. Yeah, it was interesting. I wish I had that. I don't. I don't have that. It's on Twitter somewhere. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. How do you manage all your social media activity together with being a full-time game dev? Man, I had to manage it when I was a part-time game dev, when I was moonlighting as a game dev at night. Um, I didn't have any special tools. Like, I know some people, they really like a tool called Hootsuite, which, like, if you post, you, you send one post, and it'll post it on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and do it all at the same time. I don't know if that would have saved me that much time. I just had a schedule. Um, I did have a schedule. And that really helped, like, just knowing what to do. Like, I'd always post on the Reddit feedback, uh, on the Reddit screenshot Saturdays. I'd always do Twitter screenshot, sa screenshot Saturdays. I post on Imager often. I, uh, I have a schedule so that I would fulfill the self-promotional rules for Reddit when I post it on a big subreddit, like R Gaming. And so I'd, like, make sure I was doing those filler. I, I hate calling it that, but that's really what it is. You have to do filler posts if you want to share the work that you've put your like life and all your like sweat and blood into but that's the self-promotional rules for you or they will delete your posts on the big subreddits um yeah having a schedule which helped a lot and all that's covered in the course and i have like yeah i have the schedule that i followed and the websites i posted on and i also talk about how every dev does it differently like some devs have found huge marketing success um, using discord and email lists like those are huge amazing um, tools to get your game out there and now I'm noticing the the very effective marketing tools now is their TikTok and YouTube which means you need to get good at video which means maybe it'll be worth your time to take a video editing course or learn how to edit video on you know for free on YouTube and stuff like that so yeah um, if it's okay with you I did want to show you guys one more video about the course because this is how this is what's going to support me while I make my next game over the next year or two Man, yeah, I might take, am I ready to make a new game of the, over the next couple years? But anyway, um, yeah, this little video just talks about um, like the people who've joined because we have the best, most amazing community. And that's when people buy the course, that's what they say. They're like, this was worth the money was our private Discord server. So yeah, and then remember there's only 15, they're probably, I think they might be half left, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I have a few coupon codes left. We'd love to have you join. So yeah, check this out. So I first discovered David when I was watching some GDC talks and I saw his talk about how he made the first tree while working a full-time job and ended up having tremendous success with it. I wanted to share with you how much Game Dev Unlocked has helped me to actually land my own projects. I saw one of David's videos on YouTube and immediately I wanted to join the course. And basically said that he was going to create this course to share all the things he learned about making a game, package it all into one product, and sell it to the public. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. I highly recommend joining the course and community. His approach to making games made it feel possible for someone like me, at 35, working a full-time job with a baby on the way, to actually make and finish a game. I'm not a coder. And it turns out Dave's not either. One of the pillars of his course is programming with visual scripting. I never had coded or worked with the game engine before, so the course helped me a lot with that. Uh, it's a great starting point if you've never made a game before, like I had at the time. Everything I have seen in the course, I have uh, put into practice. The community is the best. I can ask anything, and there is always someone ready to help. You know, I've been doing game development now for maybe a little over two years, and there are so many things I've learned in that course where it's just like, I never would have even thought of doing that. And I can say that it's helped me to stay motivated when I made uh, my game, and it helped me to make my first game, Core Mechanica. Having that direction 
and being able to have a course that laid everything out from start to finish. It helped unblock me from overscoping and just being able to get stuff done. I am learning new skills, I am creating games, and I'm making friends along the way. I've made some amazing friends in this class, like not just like peers, but actual like friends, I would say, you know, like people that I talk to just about every day now that I didn't know before from all over the world. There's so much help there. Everybody cares. Everybody's excited. And that alone, honestly, is so worth the value of the course. If you are on the fence, if you haven't made a game before, if you're a little shaky, or if you're just like I was when you're super duper overwhelmed and you don't know where to start, start with the course. There you have it. Uh, we'd love to have you. Um, yeah, I'll probably answer a few more questions, then I gotta get off. I actually just got a text from my wife. I was looking at it, the, the, this as the video was rolling. Our cat caught a bird and broke its wing and she was like I know you're doing a stream but maybe you should come to take it to this vet I just found a, like a vet that could take the bird and help it and then the bird died like 20 minutes later so we might go home and do a bird funeral because the kids are really upset too just life my cat is a murderer <laughs> um yeah but yeah these are I've been reading the comments I like Bjorn saying the first trash can he plays a raccoon there's actually like there's actually like a couple of raccoon games and they seem to always, you know, we talk about hooks, you know, I talk about hooks on this YouTube channel a lot and playing as a raccoon is a huge, is an amazing hook because so many, whenever there's a gif of a raccoon, like messing up trash, it always gets a ton of attention. I think people would really like a raccoon simulator. Um, yeah, what, what, else, what else we got here? Jordan, yeah, thanks Jordan. Thanks for all your, your night, good questions. Um, I did actually, I edit, that one I actually did get help was someone in the course. Um, he did help me, a guy named Zach. What's his, he has a YouTube, he actually has a really huge YouTube channel. He helped, I was able to pay him, he helped me edit that uh, testimonial. Um, but then I did edit like a shorter version, I added some stuff. So that was like the shorter testimonial video. My cat is a murderer, sounds like a fun game. <laughs> that could be a hook, like just... What if you played, you know, there's games where you play as a cat. Like, that's not super special. But what if you were, like, this psychopath cat murderer and you just don't feel bad at all? It's, like, be a mix of those, like, demented, I don't know, like, Carmageddon or Hatred, those messed up murder simulator games. <laughs> just be a cat. That'd be, that'd be pretty funny. <laughs> uh, Jordan says, last thing, there's a dev making a penguin heist game where you hold a gun. It's weird and super great. That, does, that sounds like a good hook, too. Um, thanks. Oh, if you guys have joined, that thank you. That means so much. Um, yeah, these have been great questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer one or two more. Um, Arcadius says, what are your favorite assets from the Unity Asset Store? Oh, the ones that save you the most. Like, there's the ones that you, like, you can't live without, where like, your game is based off of it. And like, if you're making a first-person game, then UFPS is essential. If you're making a third-person game, I really like Opsieve's third-person controller. That's what I use for the third, for the, for the first tree. Um, and then if you're doing controller, like if you just want to fix all of your controller and input woes, then use Rewired. It's worth it. Literally, like I had all these bugs because I used the default Unity input system um, at the beginning, like in the first tree when I first launched. And just I get so many emails, people saying, hey, this doesn't work on Linux. Hey, it doesn't work on Mac. Oh, the PlayStation controller, it like spins around forever. And then I just added rewired and literally every problem disappeared. It works perfectly with every controller ever made. And it made console porting really easy. So yeah, pick a good framework asset to save you time, good player input control, and then pick rewired. Those are my favorite assets. Um, what else? Ariana, hello, hello David. Do you look at other games as inspiration for your own games? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've told this story a lot. Sorry if you've heard it already, but I didn't have enough money to buy a PlayStation. Um, so I had to go to a rent-a-center and rent one. And because I was really looking forward to playing a few exclusives, namely Journey, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, and The Last of Us. So I rented a PlayStation 4 for like the weekends, and I played through all three games 
in a row before I had to return the PlayStation. And playing Journey is what inspired me to like, that's kind of set, like it planted the seed for the first tree. And then I played Firewatch, which I loved, and that was made with Unity. I think it uses the Unity terrain system. It uses UFPS. It uses all these different assets, the same assets I use in my games. And Firewatch was like an international bestseller. Like that was a huge hit. And so yeah, those kind of ideas inspired me to make the first tree. <laughs> Along with my creative input, you know, my own story and my own, my own, my voice acting, my own themes, the, the, like the stuff I wanted to tackle that was important to me. So yeah, first tree. I'm glad I finished the game. I almost didn't. <laughs> and now Journey's on PC. That's right. I know. That's, that's awesome. It's on iOS. You can get it on iOS, which is crazy. Um, oh, thank you, RK Games. Yeah, we'd love to have you. Um, yeah, hopefully there's a coupon code by the end of tonight. Um, cool. Okay. I'm probably going to get off. This has been fun. Thanks for watching. Thanks for checking out the course and thanks for the good questions about console porting. Um, yeah, I love consoles. It's also the hardest thing I've ever done, but I wouldn't be a full-time indie developer if it wasn't for all these platforms together, especially Nintendo switch. Nintendo Switch was almost like kind of like a jackpot thing I wasn't planning on. But even if Nintendo Switch didn't do great, like honestly, if it just did okay, which is kind of what a lot of indie games do now on Switch because it's getting more saturated every day. If all of these platforms did okay, I would be fine and I could still be a full-time indie developer because my game is on here. I'll, I'll, name, them out. I'll, I'll name them off. We got Steam, Itch, GOG, Epic Game Store, Android, iOS, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. Man, is that true? That's, it's nine. It's nine platforms. And each one brings in a little bit of money. Some of them, like, you know, some of them it's not a ton, but added up, that is enough for me to, like, and with YouTube, YouTube, ad, you know, like doing YouTube ad money helps a little bit too. And the course, of course, of course, of course, of course. The course is also going to be a huge like um, help as I make my next game, you know, supporting my family. But yeah, all those things combined, that's enough to live off of. And that's why learning to self-publish and learn, like knowing how to get on console and using these services like on, from Do Games that I showed you guys, that's how you can make the full-time indie dev thing a reality. And it will be a slow buildup. Um, you'll have to keep working on it, even if you're tired of it, because trust me, I hated the first tree by 2018, but I was like, I really want it on console. That would be really important to me, and I'm glad I did it. You'll get burnt out. It will stop being fun at times, but it, you know, it's worth it. You know, it's, it's a sacrifice. So yeah, um, thanks for your questions, guys. It's been fun, and I'll probably do this. I want to try to stream more. That's why I set up the camera in this new office. Um, I'd like to try out Unreal and maybe do more Q&As. And yeah, I'm excited for, for all this and for the future. Excited to make a new game, which people ask me a lot, like, what's your next, next game? And I spent so much time on the course, I haven't made a new game, but yeah, maybe I'll talk about it another time. But I, ha I came up with an idea that I'm really excited about, and it's something that I truly want to make, which I'm excited about. So anyway, yeah, thanks for watching, and I will see you guys in the next stream.